called Star Ties, which is about sustainable support to populations under stress, post-war, post-disaster, and impoverished. Disclaimer, these are my views on the official. Let me just quickly introduce you. Also. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the water fountain was not working in case anyone wants water. Um, this is, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome <laughs> Dr. Lynn Wells. I've known him a long time. He's absolutely wonderful, which I'm sure he will agree at the end of this um, presentation. And thank you for taking time to come. I really appreciate it. I know how busy you are. He is, he holds many titles and many hats. He's the director for the Center for Technology and National Security Policy at the National Defense University um, in Washington, D.C. Um, he's also the transformation chair there. He can explain a bit more what that is for those of you who are not as familiar uh, about what that means in government. Um, and he's also a distinguished professor. Uh, his background includes a PhD in international politics from science as well as degrees in oceanography and mathematics. He's one of the few people who can bridge tech and policy, so I'm just thrilled to have him here to talk a little bit about what his center does, and specifically Star Tides, which is a different approach to how technology can be used um, for disasters and helping stress populations in many different um, settings. So with that, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Tides, you know, the who are Tides? These are researchers at NDU. They're about five full-time people plus some uh, interns. Uh, but the heart of this is a global network. Uh, and TIDES is a Title X DOD-funded research project. So we have to play by all the DOD rules. But we are only about knowledge sharing. And because of that, we don't bend metal, we don't pick winners and losers among companies. And because of that, the general counsel says we can maintain this network, star net, with whom we can talk to anybody about anything. So right now, the network built up around this is about 3,000 different nodes that range from universities in Singapore to NGOs in Northern Europe to the Red Cross to Johns Hopkins, U.S. Marine Corps. We try to make this public, private, whole government, transnational. And the basic premise of TIDES is three things. Leverage global talent, and that's the network. Promote integrated approaches, and I'll talk about the different technologies we're looking at. But the long-term goal, unusual for a uh, DOD project, is the sustainment has to be through the private sector. The solutions have to be sustainable by local populations in their world for their resources. It does no good to have a bright, shiny object that looks great in our display field that's an operator six months after we deploy it. We <coughs> focus on what they can use. So the mission areas, some people say, why, why does DOD do this? Well, there actually are 10 Defense Department mission areas that have been laid out by the Secretary of Defense. We support four of these. We support the Humanitarian Assistance Disaster Relief Mission, um, HADR, both domestic and at home. We support building capacity of partner nations. Uh, we support stabilization and reconstruction, which is post-war. And then domestically, there's a term called defense support of civil authorities, which is defense support to governors, state, local, tribal governments, things like that. So these are the four, uh, four mission areas that TIDE is engaged in. What we do, again, knowledge sharing. We're not trying to, uh, you know, provide thingies, although we're associated with some of that. Uh, and we're working to support decision makers and those people working in the field. Post-war, post-disaster, impoverished, short-term or long-term. How long is the average stay in a refugee camp? Well, uh, more than seven years. And when I heard that, it blew my mind. Yeah. I thought, who would spend seven years? Well, I mean, look at the Palestinians. Palestinians have been there 50 years, right? Yeah. And there's some that are really stupid. Yeah. So the point is that these are qualitatively different, the long-term issues than the first 60 days after an earthquake. Different funding stream, different skill sets, different levels of commitment. Uh, so we're looking at both. Since we're also doing domestic and foreign, there really is no part of the bureaucracy that addresses what TIDES does. So, and military involved or not. So, uh, you know, DOD does military involved in home and abroad. State Department does things abroad. USAID does things abroad. FEMA does things at home. But there's no one part of the bureaucracy that covers all of them. The origin of the project actually was a simple question. How do people die? Too hot, too cold, hunger, thirst, illness, injury. So too hot, too cold is a uh, shelter heating and cooling problem. Uh, hunger, thirst is a supply chain problem. 
illness and injury is a public safety security public health problem. So we're looking at eight infrastructures. Power, shelter, and water. Integrated cooking, combustion and solar, retained heat, trying to reduce fuel use by 75 to 90% over open pit fires. And that's important in places like Haiti, Afghanistan, Sub-Saharan Africa, it's not real wood. Okay. Um, heating and cooling, sanitation, lighting, and lots of information communication technology. I'm really, really glad that Brian Steckler from MPS is here because he'll be helping me with a lot of this as we go further. It's been a great part of this for a long time. So when we talk about cyber in the context of humanitarian assistance, I mean, a large part of the cyber we'll be talking about is this the various realms of information and communications, technology, and ICT is the international term for IT, support and the threats to it, the uh, ways, the trends, uh, how it's developing. So, reiterating domestic foreign military involvement or not, but to meet the needs of local populations. Uh, and there's another very important point here in the humanitarian assistance space, but in many of these spaces. The military likes to have unity of command. You're never going to have unity of command in these situations. You've got NGOs, you've got the United Nations, you've got the local government, you've got USAID, you've got... <clears throat> so how do you provide useful support? How does the military use whatever skill sets it has to address unity of action when there is no unity of command, unity of control or command or whatever? And again, local populations, solutions useful to them. I mean, this is uh, Banda Aceh after tsunami. This is uh, Basra right after uh, folks crossed the line in 2003 going north. This is the UNVs in cell in Jakarta uh, around the Southeast Asia tsunami. Uh, it's actually interesting. This is, anybody know what this is? Other than Brian. <laughs> Other than me? <laughs> this is an inflatable satellite dish. Packs in a suitcase. Packs a couple of cases. So it blows up like a beach ball, there's a membrane inside, there's differential air pressure, the air pressure is you know, higher on, one, on, on the top side than the bottom, so the membrane becomes a parabola, it's, uh, it's mirrored, and so it acts as a reflector, and here's the feed horn. And within about an hour you can get very significant bandwidths uh, for um, very, very easy transport. Of course you need power to keep the thing blown up. So how do we do this? Radical inclusion open information sharing, and we gather and share research uh, and the new ideas. Uh, we've been involved in a number of different activities. We've been involved in California wildfires, Bangladesh cyclones, uh, people involved in the network, go back to uh, the Balkans, uh, to uh, Boxing Day tsunami, to Katrina, uh, Haiti earthquake, to tsunami, to Fukushima, to uh, uh, Haiyan, uh, and the Yolanda relief in the Philippines. One of the actual premises by which we work as a radical inclusion actually comes out of Burning Man. Everybody's got a potentially good idea. Uh, nobody gets excluded just because uh, they look different or they, uh, you know, they, they come from a different organization. So the question is, what do we mean here by ICT support? And then DOD would wrap this thing up as saying C3 ISS, C4 ISR, which is not terribly helpful to a, to a lot of audiences. But the command and control essentially is, uh, there's a socio-psychological piece to it. Uh, is, is the commander willing or interested or able to work in these kind of confused, uh, you know, rapidly changing, diverse environments? What kind of decision support have you got? You have decision support tools that help you make sense out of what's going on, evaluate options, convey orders. The feedback's really important because it doesn't do any good to give an order if there's no way to find out uh, is anybody following it. And so how do you s structure your setup so you, have the, uh, so you have the feedback? And then actually for a number of years people have been asking, is command and control really the right term uh, in this era? One of the things that's been proposed is agility focus beginning, because you're, you're never going to have unity of command. You're not going to have very tight control. So what you're trying to do is to empower the edge of the network, encourage people to self-synchronize their actions. Uh, so people have talked about agility focus convergence as one model. Essentially every organization has to be agile enough to respond to the demands being put on it. You have to have somebody to focus 
on the problem and make decisions. And then you have to have a mechanism for converging resources on the problem. Um, does that help? Not sure, but, it, but again, a lot of people feel that C2, with its top-down directive nature, really doesn't fit very much, very well. Then there's a communications and computing piece. It's going to be lots of different kinds. Some will be fixed, some will be mobile. You know, open source, some will be secure, some will be public-private. Uh, one of the things that uh, Ryan has been dealing with has been hastily formed networks. How you set up networks on the fly in austere environments and, uh, and make them work. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, you got to have sensor inputs. So what kind of sensors? Uh, so obviously you have dedicated intelligence uh, right after Haiti. Uh, the DOD flew a global hawk down there to pictures. OK, great. The satellite imagery, you come from commercial suppliers. You've got everybody with their cell phone and you know, social media. Lots and lots of issues. Again, no unity of command to tie it together. So these are kind of some of the elements, elements we're talking about. Is this cyber? Uh, well, it sure can be. Certainly a, a lot of it takes place in, in what we call cyberspace, but a lot of it is also social, cultural, outside of technology. One of the things we found in times is that the technology alone is never enough. You have to develop the social networks and build the trust to get people to work together. The policy and doctrine is often pretty good, but if the people on the ground don't know what it is and how they can interpret it, what their left and right limits are, then you're not going to implement it effectively. You have to understand the legal and regulatory regimes in which you're working. For example, if the Defense Department buys a piece of equipment and donates it to the host country, if we violated some law about the uh, Foreign Affairs Act, how do you get something through customs? Current problem. Um, you need to look at the resources, but the really important piece is that no lesson is ever, ever learned until behavior changes. You observe a lesson, then you come back next year and reobserve the same lesson, and you come back next year and reobserve the same lesson. So how do you put together the combination of education and training and exercises and incentives to actually cause people to do things differently? Until you incorporate that. <laughs> no problem. So one of the things really important, I think, to pay attention to here, again, whether you call it cyber, whether you call it SGT, whether you call it, is the pace of change. So if you believe a computer power per unit cost is doubling about every 18 months, maybe it's 14 months, maybe it's 20 months, whatever it is, it's about this. Uh, then by the middle of the next year, we're going to have a 100% increase in computing power. By 2020, that's 1,500 percent. By 2030, it's 100,000%. You can't draw a linear line from your iPhone today to where you're going to be in five years. And so how do you factor that into uh, nonlinear projection of your plan? The next piece is the private sector is driving this. Government likes to think it's in control or not. The investment, the innovation is going on in the private sector. And what's driving the private sector now are five things. Speed, mobility, privatization, big data, and the cloud. That's where the investment's going. Um, in addition, we're moving from e-commerce to e-commerce. Okay, so instead of just you know, very localized, location-based, personalized services. And this is only going to accelerate. You walk by uh, stores and they're going to send notes to your mobile device offering sales and discounts. I already saw something in the D.C. area, I presume it's out here too, that I want to say it's Office Depot, uh, maybe it's Staples, is actually offering discounts based on the, your proximity to a competitor. <laughs> so, you know, if it sees you're within two blocks of the Staples, then Office Depot will give you a higher discount than if you're uh, you know, far away from it. So, uh, how do you factor all that stuff in? Uh, Internet of Things. What can, can tell me about the Internet of Things? Okay, so this is basically your, ma'am. No, no, tell me about the Internet of Things. No, no, go ahead. Device, device, you. Oh, see, devices that are eventually going to be connected to the Internet, like refrigerator, toaster. Exactly. This is your cell phone talking to your toaster. And this is, uh, I mean, actually, I actually saw some, probably some company. Some company has actually been hacked through the corporate refrigerator. Right. His refrigerator was a proximity to the internal corporate network. Somebody's able to get in the refrigerator and get into the corporate network. Uh, there's some very interesting stuff going on about uh, hacking cars now. 
uh, if you have a tire pressure sensor, the tire pressure sensor is typically connected to your car's um, central computer via Bluetooth link, which is essentially insecure. And there's a lot of stuff going on about how you can shut the brakes off and cause the steering to fail and things like that. Why these kind of things? So, so the Internet of Things. But about three weeks ago, coming out of the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, I increasingly heard people talking about the Internet of Everything. And the everything in this case is the human body becomes a platform. As we go more to wearable computing, as we go more to implanted medical devices, as we go more to. So, one of the big challenges from an information assurance cyber perspective in all this is <coughs> your identity management. How do I know that you know, you're the person you say you are? But now, if somebody said, How do I know this is who you're toast with? <laughs> How do I know that this is who you're, you know, you're whatever you're facing? Uh, and so it, it adds a whole new set of dimensions as, as to what personal identity personally identifying information, PII is, what, uh, how you authenticate, how you identify, things like that. Uh, the sensors are exploding. Uh, there's a wonderful picture in uh, Economist about a year ago about two uh, Afghan women in burkas, completely covered from head to foot holding cell phones. The point is governments are no longer able to restrict the flow of information in the way they could in the past. Can they still screw with it? Sure. Can they still deceive, deny, degrade? Yeah. But the, the information is out there. Um, every quarter, uh, my center participates in the field experimentation that Naval Postgraduate School puts on down at Camp Roberts every February, May, August, November. <coughs> and this, this week, actually, on Thursday. Wednesday, Thursday. Um, mm -hmm. There were five or six different experiments that were dealing with social media. How can you, how can you make sense out of what's out there in social media? And most of these were focused on uh, looking at Sandy data. Right? You heard from Sandy. But what they did on the fly, on Wednesday we shifted the data feeds to real-time feeds out of the uh, uh, East Coast storms. So they actually were taking live Twitter scrapes and uh, Facebook feeds and things like that from Atlanta as the ice cream went through on, on, on Wednesday. And it was just fascinating to see how much could be done. Uh, so, any of you worn Google Glass? I, you know, I, I wore mine and wore it for the first time the other day. It, it's really, this is the you know, glasses that have the camera in it and shows your heads up. And so one of the questions is, it'll take a while to get used to, but by 2020, how many people will still be having handheld devices? How much is all going to be somehow wearable and heads-up display and uh, what's that going to be? Um, and one of the real concerns from a decision-making point of view, which is also a concern from a cyber and that CT, is the volume and velocity of information generated by the 24-7 news cycle on social media is just overwhelming. And so how do you make sense out of this? It's not a question of really, it's even not a question of making sense. It's how do you avoid from just giving up from information overload. Um, so there's actually a number of projects going on in this IP squared category. So uh, this was a quick <laughs> snapshot of the ICT support picture in, in Haiti. And, and all one needs to do is just look at the picture without getting into any of the eaches and understand that this is a really complicated problem. And uh, the issue about unity of effort with no unity of control is really what, what pertains. But the point is you've got each one of these boxes, each one of the lines, a different organization. I mean, so you've got uh, up here, you've got the World Bank, you've got In Relief, you've got the UN Spider, you've got the, the UN Relief in Haiti, uh, you've got uh, NATO, you've got UN uh, uh, OCHA, you've got World Food Program, which is telecommunications cluster. So you're the kind of people that you know, outside what DOD would like to work at, which is the military's you know, unclassified and classified networks, these are the key players that are out there. And how do you find ways to, you get all these nice satellite communications that go to all the people, but they have different satellites to different organizations, 
you know, if there's not a lot of dotted lines or in some of these clouds. So this is the environment you know, have to be working in. And the reason why it just puts off again, there's not going to be any control how you get any action in these cases. So one of the models we looked at for the moment is called crowd crowd bridge transaction feedback. So what happened in Haiti was the Southern Command in Miami actually did a fairly good job about tapping into some of the things that were going on in the planet. They used things like OpenStreetMap, they used things like uh, um, Twitter, Twitter, SMS texting. And so they, they set up a cell within the organization, a bridge, if you will, to the crowd. And then somebody says, okay, well, that's nice, but how does this work, say, in Afghanistan? where you don't have the same kind of benign security environment. So we did a paper called From Haiti to Belmont. It looked about what the different uses of this social media might be in that environment. And what came out of this was that each organization involved in an operation involving the crowds would have to build a different bridge. So the bridge that Southern Command built for Haiti is going to be different than the bridge the International Security Assistance Force built for Taiwan is different than the bridge that the UN built for South Sudan is different than whatever. And so it's not, and so you need to find a way to design the bridge that fits with your culture and your, your communications, whatever, to tap into the cloud. So we took this model down to Miami, talked about it to NGOs, and said, what we learned? And I said, look, unless you turn this into some transaction, that makes a difference on the ground. People pulled from rubble, supplies delivered, contract fulfilled. This is just you techie guys packing yourselves in the back and exchanging electrons. So all this you know, knowledge of what's happening in the crowd, decision support, has to turn into something that makes a difference. And then the feedback is you can either feed back to the crowd to try to shame them into doing something better, like delivering more supplies, or you can deliver some street communication message or do something. But again, you have, so this is kind of what we've settled on. You need the, the crowd is going to gen, generate information whether you want it or not. Now you need to find a way to bridge to it, then you have to find a way to turn to transactions, and you have to find a way to tell people what's going on uh, or try to shape the crowd. Um, Typhoon Haiyan. I think most of you know about this. Typhoon goes to the central Philippines. Interestingly, in March, April, or so of 2010, the Philippines had a very interesting conference called Engineering for Resilience. It was the name of the conference. And it stemmed from the fact that in late 2009, there had been a typhoon that put 27 feet of water in parts of Metro Manila. And they said, hmm, what happened? So it turns out that um, that there's a, it turns out that a lot of the feeder streams and marshes you know, would have absorbed the water and concreted over and so it just moved. But by the time this had happened, the Haiti earthquake and the Chile earthquake had happened. So, so the Philippines extended this beyond that question about the, the water pooling and said, what can we do to make our country more resilient going forward? And uh, so the first thing was, uh, it was clear that the difference in damage between Haiti and Chile was one of the building standards uh, and enforcement of building codes. And the Philippines were honest enough to realize that they were probably closer to Haiti than to Chile and the uh, rigor in which they were enforcing the building codes. So they took that as an action. But they then took a look at future climatological models. And one of the things they said was, and it's hard to extrapolate global climate models to regional impacts. When they expressly said they expected more of the typhoon tracks to be going south through the central Philippines. So I don't know if they've done anything. It's only two years really to, to get ready, or three years to get ready. But, but they clearly were anticipating this kind of additional uh, problem. In addition, the Philippine military does better than many others in incorporating dialogue with NGOs and non-traditional mission participants in their training. They actually have NGOs come and talk at their war college. Uh, and so they had a pretty good dialogue going. So, so Tides was involved in this peripherally. I mean, there were people on the ground. I want to turn this over now to Dr. Stockholm. Uh, so we had 
we helped in some ways with equipment, comms, coordination, documentation, just a joint professional military education, and really being able to tap into the network helped. But I just wanted to focus on this because we're talking about cyber, about the communications piece. So, <clears throat> why don't I just stop here for a moment and Brian, would you like to talk about this? Sure. Yeah. So I run the Hasty Forum Network Center over at NPS um, since 2005. Uh, one of the things we've done in the last two, three years with some funding from the Lynn's old office of the Office of Secretary of Defense is we um, planted the seed to conduct rapid ICT. What is ICT? Information and Communication Technologies. It's more than just IT. In the U.S. we're talking about IT, okay. which tends to imply the Internet, but this is radio and everything else. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So the top line there, Hasty Forum Networks, uh, we rapidly take communication capabilities out to a disaster zone because the normal infrastructure is expected to be wiped out. No copper, no fiber, no UHF, no VHF, no cellular. Um, nothing that you use to communicate now is working. So we have to bring that in. <clears throat> we bring it in in small form factors, in Pelican cases, flyaway kits that you can check on airline as baggage to get out there with the gear so you don't have to worry about customs and the delays with uh, shipping. <clears throat> and then uh, at NPS, I take students out with me so they can do their master's thesis work or learn um, different aspects of uh, the communications infrastructure um, re rebuilding. And in the last couple of years, one of the things that we've started and now has kind of grown virally is this rapid ICT assessment teams concept. And uh, right now, there are 20 or 30 different organizations involved in that, including private sector. Cisco, Microsoft, Inmarsat, a number of others, academia, NDU, NPS, San Diego State University, Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, and a bunch of other academic institutions, our government, State Department, Department of Defense, um, other smaller agencies were involved in Haiti, FAA and FCC and organizations like that, and uh, host nation governments and militaries. So the idea is that nobody knows when they're on their way out to the disaster zone to respond, UN, NGO, military, government, industry, whoever's going out, they don't know what they're going to face out in the disaster zone as far as how their equipment that they bring for communications is going to work. So we send these teams out to document that status of IT or ICT and put that somewhere where the public can access it, public early responders can access it, so they know what works on the cellular towers. Is it text only? Is it voice? Is it text and voice? Is it neither? And why isn't that working? Is it because it was wiped out by the storm surge or the wind? Or was it wiped out because there's no power? So we document all of those things, put it up on a web portal that the Pacific Disaster Center out in Maui maintains with all, kind, with all hazards disaster information in real time. And then the early responders can passively go to this site and see, okay, I'm going to this area. They've done an assessment there. Now I know what the status of IT is in that area there. Our most recent activities after two and a half years of kind of getting it formed up and collecting all these organizations and developing the, the tools and techniques and procedures, uh, we went and did a baseline assessment of IT in the most disaster prone areas of, area of the Philippines last September. Well, guess when Haiyan hit, Typhoon Yolanda? Two months later, that hit. So we had just done an IT assessment in a disaster prone area of the Philippines with 80 people, including all different uh, Philippine government and military and the international community. So we knew how to do these assessments in the country that we then went to for an actual response, an actual rapid IT assessment team effort and worked with the uh, Armed Forces of the Philippines and the U.S. military, the Marines, to get airlift so we could get out to the disaster zones. Well, we discovered when we got out there that well, we need to get around to do these assessments. We need to drive two days, three days down the coast from Ground Zero at the airport in Tacloban or over to the next big city in Ground Zero, Guyon, and uh, we couldn't find vehicles. There were vehicle, most vehicles were destroyed. Vehicles we could get, they wanted three or four hundred dollars a day to rent with cash. Now, who can get cash in a disaster zone when ATM and the telephone system is out? So, 
one of the reasons why we took the RTAC teams into a real disaster was to cut our teeth and find out some of these gotchas. And there were several other gotchas that I can talk about. I have a whole presentation on this thing that um, I'd be happy to come back anytime and talk about it and come over to MPS. Um, one thing I'd like to also stress is that this RTAP capability is open to you all if you want to get involved. Uh, I, on the fly, recruit NPS students to go out to the disaster zones with me. I'd love to take some of my IS students with me out there. It's a great experience. You're gone. You get out of classes for a couple of weeks. You go to the disaster <laughs> zone. You're not what I call disaster tourists, people who go there just to see what's happening. You're actually doing stuff. Uh, so you're welcome to, and I'll leave my card for anybody that's interested. Uh, Just curious, how many hours it took you to have initial assessment, let's say, in the case of height? Uh, you can get a meaningful assessment of the cellular system and the power system in hours because you just pull your cell phone out and either text or data, text or voice works or it doesn't. You ask around and they tell you, well, the power is out, which was a problem in Haiti. They shut power down every night for weeks and weeks. At, 10 o'clock p.m. and started it at 6 a.m. to conserve fuel for the generators because that's how they had power in 1980. So you can find out quickly. The trick is to get that information, actionable intelligence out to the to the consumers who are the early responders. So then we started to work with PDC, Pacific Disaster Center, to put this information up and online. And now we're improving how that uh, works automatically. It's been manual until now. Now we're doing uh, Twitter feeds in real time as part of this um, and other uh, little tricks with that live web portal so that we can get that information out. While the Navy ship is sailing from Norfolk to go down to Haiti, they can access it and know what equipment they need to bring ashore. Or the UN agency just set up that, that blow-up satellite terminal in one location in Haiti or Tacloban and right across the uh, concrete wall or the next building over, somebody else puts a satellite terminal up with high bandwidth. Well, that's a waste of resources. That one terminal can cover a huge area. Take the other terminal to another area that has nothing. So that's the kind of thing we can assist with. Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> um, harkening back to the old Strong Angel 1, 2, and 3 days, Strong Angel is a multinational, interorganizational exercise that was done in 2000 in Maui, 2002 or three again three. in Maui, and then 2005 six. or six in San Diego, and a new Strong Angel 4 is going to happen in Mexico this mm -hmm. October, which you all are also welcome to find more out about. Uh, conflict and power were the themes for Strong Angel. Conflict and power are three of our primary Achilles heels for all of us in the early responder community. Those three things create major headaches for getting your job done. <laughs> Just think about how and, important and the problem is people are focused on the major muscle movements, the living food, water, water, shelter, things like that. But these are the critical enablers of knowing what you need. And so something you gotta get the connect comms there to restore it, which means you have to prioritize lift on helicopters or trucks or whatever. And you have to be aware of either the towers have are independent of the power grid, they have to find some ways to bring the power back up. People tend not to think about that. They tend to think about the other issues. And the first one, their comms. Uh, Dr. Wells talked about uh, the, the, the the critical and hard to come by nature of finding out who's in charge, who the leadership is, command and control, coordination and cooperation in the UN terms. Uh, communications enables that. If you can't communicate, you can't operate. General thing, right? Um, so just a couple more bullets there, and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Wells. Uh, another project we're doing in the Philippines is along the western coast, aiming out at the Reed Bank and the Spratly Islands, because the certain country is trying to influence that area. Won't mention any names. Uh, they're putting radars to detect tsunamis and, and weather and ship movement out in that area of contention. Uh, O3B is a satellite company that is bringing out a game-changing high-speed, high-capacity broadband satellite internet connectivity solution, 50 megabits per second down and 10 megabits up. For anybody in the IT networking world, they know those are big numbers over satellite. Uh, NPS has a uh, data collection, dissemination, and analytical tool called Lighthouse in our uh, core lab. 
We use that for these RTAD assessments with a handheld Android phone, punching in answers to a bunch of pre-designated questions in an application. Push the send button, goes to NPS to a server to get processed. Another button that goes to PDC in Maui to get processed and put up on the web display. So NPS's Lighthouse program is key to this. Um, disaster Aware is the PDC, Pacific Disaster Center, product that displays all this information. If you all want to check that out and get an account, go to www.pdc.org and ask for an account and you can see it in real time. Just tell them you're from an academic institution, you're not from industry trying to get a free, unlicensed copy of access to it because they do sell their product as well. Questions on that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so just to open, wrap it up here and open up the questions. So, some other points. Open source tools are really, really important to this. And this again gets to the definition of what is cyber. And that's where I want to go here for this. Is I've been thinking cyber in the startize context more in terms of ICT, or the message on ICT support. But part of this, open source tools are really, really, really important. Uh, open street map, uh, and we've, have you heard about OpenStreetMap? <laughs> okay, so OpenStreetMap is where I basically you know, enable a GPS app on my phone and I wander around streets. I basically, it's a geospatial wiki. And so as you, as you walk down, uh, and it records where you're walking, and then you can upload that to the internet and annotate it. So you can say, okay, I'm walking down uh, you know, Dulles Street, I'm turning right on Fifth Avenue, I'm turning left on Muller Road, and that map now becomes a shareable map on the internet that anybody can see. And after Haiti especially, when everything was destroyed, we were able to reconstruct the street maps of Haiti in you know, days, including here's where the refugee camps are, here's where the water storages are, here's whatever. Uh, Sahana is, came out of the tsunami in 2004. It's a uh, logistics disaster management uh, type program, open source, here's where the water is, I need water, here's where needs water. And walking papers now, street papers, like that. Anyway, this is, uh, you can download the OpenStreetMap map onto a printer, you print it out, get a little georeference cord in the corner, and now you can put a clipboard and walk around and make written comments on the map. When you upload it back, that, uh, that uh, georeference deletes all the stuff that had been downloaded originally, so all you're doing is uploading the written annotation to the internet map. Uh, and it's a way of uh, dealing with a form factor. If you say you need to walk around with a computer, it's a very simple way to do it. There's a wonderful community called Crisis Mappers. Uh, and I encourage you, if you're interested, to get involved with them. They have been involved with, uh, I first largely got involved with them just before Haiti. But they've since been involved in almost every major disaster that's going on. But some of the important issues that came out of this were in uh, Libya and now Syria. Uh, and there was a sense among the crisis mappers that open information essentially is good. Uh, and the more you share, the better. And what happens you get these conflict zones is what may be open information good to one party becomes strategic uh, war information to another. Uh, and so you had individuals being intimidated. And uh, during in Mexico, I think in early 2014, 13, there were a number of crisis mappers who were killed by drug cartels. Uh, for, for being too transparent. Uh, and so in Syria right now, uh, the crisis mappers require that everyone uses hush mail, uh, and they spend a lot of time vetting uh, the, uh, the individuals. The problem, of course, is you roll up anybody in the network in Syria and get able to get access to the crisis mappers, then you, you put the other players at risk. Uh, the other thing that's been happening is about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, uh, when they had the protests in Russia against Putin, and the international community was broadcasting all these protests, so the crisis mappers got involved in that. And what the Russian government did was they had somebody come up on the news, you know, with a generic name like Olga or something, and she reported that uh, there was a, a huge protest against uh, Putin in such and such a city. And in you know, hours, it winds up on the, uh, the crisis map map. Turns out there is no such city. 
and so the uh, and so there are ways for you know, I think what's going to turn out of this whole thing is that this is going to be information that can be manipulated, degraded, uh, deceived, and, uh, corrupted, just like any other information. And <clears throat> so eventually, one is going to have to apply the same kind of uh, caveat emptor skepticism to the information in these sorts of humanitarian spaces, uh, as you will, and uh, just about anything else. Uh, so. Some of these will be cyber tools that will be applied. Some of them will be just uh, like in the uh, false news reporting, just uh, bum information. Some of it uh, uh, will just be, if you look at the pictures of Sandy, I mean, all sorts of weird pictures posted of sharks on the subway and dark clouds over the <laughs> Statue of Liberty that were just you know, made up Photoshop pictures. Again, the information's out there, there's more information we've ever had out there. It's going to be up to the decision makers to figure out how to make sense of it. The other point, of this, this I found really interesting. I, usually when we have a conference at National Defense University, my question is how many people here are under 35? And this is a much older audience, so I typically got single digit hands here from that. The question is, what do you all know that we should know? And this naval lieutenant stands up and says, well, you know, so nobody in my generation ever uses the word cyber. Uh, except we come to a government conference, you tell us we use the word cyber. <laughs> so I said, what do you do? Well, we're online, we're linked in, we're connected. You know, how does a fish describe the water it swims in? And so the point there for me was that uh, you know, naval operations are actually only a minuscule part of all the operations in the maritime domain, the commerce, the fishing, the drilling, or whatever. And actually, national security cyber operations are only going to be a minuscule part of the overall operations of the information domain. And so as we work through the, uh, uh, Yamar and I were talking earlier about the myriad terms that people have for this. And so uh, you know, when, when the comment, the first question was, what's, how does cyber apply to star ties? Because we don't typically think of it in that context. And certainly if you think about it as some application of operation of the information domain, then there's very much to apply to humanitarian systems. And what's the right the definition? So these are the coordinates for tides, Star Tides. We would love to have you join. Uh, <coughs> you, can, you can participate at any level from just getting a newsletter every month to put out to actually joining a project and working on the effort. Uh, it's been great fun so far. It's free, by the way. Absolutely free. <laughs> yes. And they have publications up there. So, yeah. All right. So let me stop and open it to uh, the question.